I welcome everyone to today's seminar. Today's seminar breaks a long string of seminars given by Nobel Prize winners. <laughs> well, okay, not a long string, just one. But that's the reason you're eating pizza today and not uh, entrees by, uh, what was it, La Prima we had? So today's speaker is Dr. Robert F. Adler, also known as Bob. Um, he's been, I've known him for 40 years. He's been a colleague, a boss, and a friend. I think you'll give me two out of three of those, right? Yep. Okay. He um, has all his degrees in meteorology. He's got a bachelor's and master's from Penn State and a PhD from Colorado State University in 1974. Oh. You never tell the date. <laughs> I got there in 75 and his reputation was still intact. In fact, I was told you were the first graduate student to serve as a representative on the department faculty meetings, right? We, 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 you made a lot of friends there. <laughs> in uh, 75, he joined Goddard Space Flight Center, where he spent an amazing, by my calculation, 43 years. As you came to Essex in 2008. Yep, and he's been at Essex since then. Um, during that time, we both worked in what was called the Severe Storms Branch under one of the greats, uh, Dr. Joanne Simpson. Uh, when she stepped down, Bob became branch head in uh, 1990, a position he held for about 10 years. And during that time, some of the awards he received were the um, William Nordberg Award for Earth Science and NASA's Medal for Outstanding Leadership and Exceptional Scientific Achievement. I would think he would be um, most proud of his tenure as project scientist on the tropical rain measuring mission. As you know, this was a three year mission, ostensibly, which turned into a 17 year mission, largely in part due to the efforts of this guy. After three years, when they wanted to terminate it due to budget regions, he worked both, both privately and not so privately to, uh, to keep the thing running. He figured out that by boosting its orbit, we could uh, reduce atmospheric drag and keep the thing um, uh, working even longer. And when they wanted to bring the thing down using the fuel for controlled reentry, he showed that their statistics were not quite what they seemed. And the result was the thing just did a crash and burn and came down. I always felt that he had a little bias there because he lived just north of 37 and a half degrees where he, so there was no chance that where he lived to work, he would get hit by the satellite. Um, so enough of that today, we welcome Bob Adler and his talk is real-time global flood monitoring using satellite rainfall and hydrology models. Well, thank you, Andy. I think you got about 60% of that correct, but it's, it's, it's close, close enough. Well, thanks for coming today. Um, what I'd like to do is, is give you an idea of what some of us have been working on actually for uh, quite a while, about 10 years, of using satellite rainfall to try to say something about floods on a, on a global basis. And uh, there are a lot of people that have contributed to this. Obviously, their names are up here, Guo Zhanggu, Naijian Zhao, who's actually in the geography department, JJ Wang, and Huan Wu here from uh, Sun Yat-sen University, although he seems to be spending a lot of time here in Maryland lately. And other people that uh, I'll come back and hopefully describe uh, what they're doing also. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what our system is and, uh, and how it works. I'm not gonna go into real depth because I won't be able to tell you so much about the results. I'm gonna focus on one case, uh, Mozambique last year. I'm gonna talk about uh, satellite rainfall. I'm gonna compare some of our calculations to uh, other information from other satellite data and give you an idea of maybe who uses the information and, and, how, the, and how they use it. This all starts with uh, satellite rainfall and that's actually how I got into it. Uh, and he mentioned the Tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission, TRIM, and it was actually the place where George Huffman and I kind of invited, in, invented the idea of using multiple microwave satellites and merging the data into a data product that uh, became what was called 3D42 or TMPA and other things. 
Uh, but that has kind of gone by the wayside. But the, the recent product we're using now is what's called iMERGE. And you can see the name up here. It's from based on the Global Precipitation uh, Measurement Mission, uh, GPM, over, over at NASA. It basically merges microwave observations from different satellites, the rainfall estimates from that, cross-calibrated with radar from the, the core satellite, the GPM core satellite. And now what's done is there's space-time integration uh, using model-based moisture fields. So you're trying to take those approximately every three hour microwave observations and come up with an analysis at finer time and space resolution. In fact, iMERGE has a tenth of a degree lat long and 30 minute resolution. There's an early version, a late version, and a final that uses some gauge uh, measurements. Uh, it's actually similar to other products that are out there. Uh, Noah Seymour, Ping Ping Shah is here. He's the, the Seymour person. And also the Japanese GS map. In fact, iMERGE uses some of Ping Ping's uh, software to do the, uh, uh, the space-time uh, integration. Uh, for GF GFMS, for our global flood monitoring system, we use iMERGE early, which has about seven hours latency. And we actually degrade the resolution down to an eighth of a degree and three hours to put into our hydrologic uh, calculations. The overview here I'm going to do go through pretty quickly, but we use a satellite rainfall and that goes into a land surface model, actually a VIC model at the eighth of a degree resolution. And we calculate runoff and you're probably basically familiar with hydrology models that do that. And then that runoff water is put into a routing uh, model. And that's actually done at an eighth of a degree and at one kilometer. And I'll come back to that. And then based on retrospective running of the model over a number of years, we actually at each grid point set a threshold. And if we go over that threshold in terms of the runoff, then, then that says we, we have a, a flood. We can look at each day, we can get maps quasi-globally. Globally, we go 50 north to 50 south. And we can zoom in and, and look at areas. And then we can take time histories of, even, of stream flow, like in here, or a flood parameter, in this case, the, uh, wa the water depth over a, over a threshold. This whole system has actually been built by Juan Wu, who's here in the audience, when he worked here for a number of years before he left to go back to uh, I'm a professor in, in China. And he's done a really excellent job. And we're basically using what, what he has done. We also do things at one kilometer, both the routing, and we also do an inundation calculation. And I'll, I'll come back to that. So this kind of summarizes is all this stuff, uh, rainfall product, uh, what we're using here. We actually do flood forecasts out to about five days also by using data from the NASA GEOS FP model, which is a numerical weather prediction model. And we attack those on the end, those rainfall estimates on the end of the satellite measurements and come up with flood estimates for the flood forecast. We do that one kilometer inundation. I'll come back to that. There are limitations. There are no dams in the system right now. So it's a natural system, which obviously can get you into trouble. The time lag is about nine hours once we actually get results. We do have, I think, some still has a problem. So we try to take into account snow on the ground and melting and things like that. And the flash floods are difficult. Since this microwave satellite data is approximately three hours apart, you're really going to miss a really short term event. So that's a problem. So we do much better at uh, bigger, bigger systems. And uh, you know, some of the data is used by people, and I'll come back to that. But I actually have a show of hands. How many people here, once in a while, get out of their office and go outside on the trail by, the, by out here? How many people? Almost everybody. Well, that's, that's good. Because where, are you, where is Essex sitting? OK, here's DC. This is the Anacostia River Basin outlined here. And Essex sits along 
hopefully you guys know what the name of the river is. It's the northeast branch of the Anacostia. Okay, so it's it's a very small basin. It's about 250 square kilometers above Essex here, just over this area here. And if you look at our global system at the eighth of a degree, it's hard to find things. If you zoom in some, you can start seeing rivers like over the southeast uh, U.S. If you zoom in even further, our area, you can see the Potomac and the Patuxent and the Patapsco, et, et cetera. And if you do it at one kilometer, you, you're starting to see uh, actual river system. If you come over here to the right, if you can see in the light green here, now we're looking at something that sort of looks like this. So we're seeing the branches like of the northeast branch of the Atacostia right here as you walk out by the river actually shows up in our system. So what happens when you look for the stream flow in our system? So when I put a little astro, a little marker here and do a calculation of the stream flow right outside our door here of the, in the northeast branch of the Anacostia. This is for the last month, February 2020 here. You can see a typical, this small river like this, you had relatively low flow as a base. And then every time you have a rain event in the system, you get a flash and the, and the uh, stream flow jumps up. That's kind of interesting. That's how it shows up in our global system. Well, if you go south and you walk south, you might know that there is a river gauge station about a kilometer south of here for the USGS. So here's that same plot here with our, with our system. And here's the observed stream flow uh, from, the, uh, from the National Weather Service and USGS. Now they like to use a log scale and they like to use cubic feet per second. We are doing cubic meters per second and a linear scale. So you can go back I and mean, you can see that we're, we're picking up a number of the rainfall events. And if you look at, if you integrated some of the flow, we're not doing too badly. Although if you look out here, these, we've got two events and they have two events, but they're not exactly at the same time and location, which is kind of an interesting thing. So this gives you an idea that we actually have the capability to get down to this kind of scale, but not without uh, imperfections, obviously. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I tried to match up uh, magnitudes here in cubic feet per second and uh, cubic meters per second. So the idea here is this one's showing up ab above that and so is this one. But some of the others in terms of magnitude, they're different. Also the base flow, we're getting the base flow about right. Which is, I like to see that kind of thing. And another point about this, that's the one kilometer plot from our system. If I look at that same point in the 12 kilometer, I get this calculation. So I'm seeing even though you can't really define that specific stream, you can get a stream flow estimate that looks fairly similar. Well, let's, let's take a look. We're going to spend a fair amount of time here on a case that happened last year uh, in Mozambique. And uh, this was a big event, one of the biggest events that we've been involved in. Uh, a thousand people died in, in Mozambique, and there was like three quarters of a billion dollars in, uh, in uh, damage, and about 100,000 homes were destroyed or, or damaged. And we're gonna, it looked like this from the air, and we're going to take a look at it from various remote sensing calculations and uh, devices. You may hopefully you know where Mozambique is. Uh, it's in the southeast uh, corner of Africa in through here in the Indian Ocean. It kind of sits across the strait from, uh, Mos <coughs> uh, from uh, Madagascar. Capital's actually down here. There's a town uh, up here, a fairly big town, Beria. And you can see the rivers in here, the Zambezi's up here, the Limpopo, if you're familiar with those, is down here. And we're going to see flooding primarily in, in, the, in the middle of this. It's right up against the uh, coast. If 
if you look right before the, uh, uh, the, the flooding event, uh, this is associated with Cyclone Adai, uh, which was, it came in from the uh, southern Indian Ocean. Originally, a few days before, it was forecast to hit much further north, but it made a turn and came in. And you can see, obviously, this is a three-hour uh, rain estimate uh, coming, coming out of our system, going into the, uh, uh, the land surface model. So you can get an idea. It was a pretty good cyclone. In fact, they had wind damage. They had uh, other things happening. And then they had uh, the flooding uh, going on. Look at that. I mentioned we do forecast with the numerical weather prediction uh, data uh, going into the system. So this is actually a three-day rain forecast coming out of the, the NASA GEOS model, the FP model. And if you look at it, it's, this is a three-day forecast from the 14th of March uh, through the 17th. And uh, you have this has actually had up to a total of 1,000 millimeters of rainfall in the NWP forecast. That's really, really large, obviously. If you now go forward and you use the satellite data to make the same estimate over the same time, it's not a forecast now, it's a remote sensing estimate, you get a pattern that looks very much like the forecast. That's the good news. The forecast was actually pretty good. If you look at the central part, you can see it looks like we're getting a lower number. In fact, the, uh, the satellite estimate was getting closer to like 600 millimeters. So it's getting less rainfall than the forecast. That doesn't mean it's the wrong rainfall, it's just less than the forecast. So we did a pretty good job of locating the forecast, and this is the uh, satellite estimate. 600 millimeters over three days is still one heck of a lot of water coming into your area. <laughs> now, obviously, with that forecast rainfall, we can do a forecast of, uh, of where the flood's going to be. And that's this here, using a, a parameter that's uh, water depth above that flood threshold. So you get looking at depths of water at an eighth of a degree calculation in this. And this is the estimate. So this was done three days ahead of time. And this is essentially the now cast using the satellite rainfall into the same uh, flood system calculation. And you can see that location-wise, it's, it's doing pretty good. You can see that there's less sort of yellow, orange, and, and red over here. Even this area over here in uh, Zimbabwe is uh, approximately correct. So in, in terms of the forecast, the calculation, we're at least getting something similar from the, the satellite rainfall than we got from the NWP, but it looks like a little bit less intense. Now here's the, to just give you a picture, this is the seven-day rainfall ending on the uh, 18th of March. The flooding, the storm was coming in like on the 15th. So we're backing it up here a little bit. You can see the track of the storm as it came in. And you can see the maximum. We're going to come back to this diagram a little bit later. So the question is, how, how good is the satellite rainfall data? Because that's obviously is, is driving the whole flood calculation. Well, as often is the case when we're trying to do this in a remote area, in a relatively underdeveloped area, and especially during an event like this where infrastructure tends to dissipate. We, we, we have a real, uh, real hard time finding out how, how good the satellite data was, uh, how good the satellite precip estimates here. But we made an attempt here. Uh, Jean Gu did all these calculations. And this, this image up here is actually the iMERGE uh, total over a long period from the 4th to the 21st of uh, March. And this is the GPCC one degree gauge analysis. And you can see it looks a lot different. Even over here in Madagascar, that the gauges are getting a lot more rain. One of the reasons that we went all the way back to the fourth to make this calculation, it was actually another heavy rain event further to the north up here 
before the cyclone Idai uh, came in. But we tried to look at that. And you can look at the difference maps. You can do other things. So over here is what a percentile matching. So taking every one degree daily grid and just not matching them up like a scatter diagram, like in the upper right, but just matching magnitude versus magnitude to get an idea to cut down on the scatter so you can see things a little easier, et cetera. And it looks like, at least over this long period, that the gauges are estimating a larger values than the satellite, which says, okay, we might have a problem with the satellite estimates, in this case at least, being low. We don't really know. But we can do some other things. For example, you can forget about Mozambique for a minute. You can come back to the United States when you have a big event like this. And maybe you can really still have a handle on what the uh, rainfall truth is. This is Hurricane Harvey from back in 2017. This is the iMERGE map. This is the CPC, now quarter degree, uh, gauge analysis. A difference map, and it's like, okay, we got the right, looks like we got about the right answer, but if you look at the difference map, it looks like iMERGE is overestimating to the north and underestimating to the south. The point is, nothing is ever really that easy, okay? But if you look at the scatter plot, and, can't tell, but it's a minus 14,000. Thank you. Uh, let's see, I think I missed. the mouse. I want to go back. Okay, yeah, back to Harvey here. If you looked at the percentile matching for Harvey, irrespective of the scatter plot here, the scatter is minus 14 percent, that you, you can tell that, uh, you know, we have a similar type of situation where it looks like the gauges are, are, are higher at the high end. In other words, the satellite estimates might be low at the high end, okay? And that's the kind of thing we're trying to look for. But again, these are individual cases. Now, if you put a few cases together, here's a die over here, here's Harvey down here, and then we have three other cases over the US, Hurricane Florence, Dorian, and Barry, and they all seem to be showing sort of the same thing. So we might have some evidence that we're underestimating at the high end. But this is the kind of thing we have to deal with that, you know, we don't really know for sure. And there still needs to be a lot of work on this, especially in these kind of cases. I mean, these are obviously all tropical cyclones. And we'll come back to that. But keep that, keep that kind of in mind that we might be over underestimating at the high end. Let's go back to the, uh, uh, the Mozambique case. And here, here's a flood map in which is showing a parameter stream flow above the flood threshold. So where you're seeing the yellow and the orange here is where you have the stream flow. This is the Hungi River here that's coming down from the north right into just to the adjacent to the town of Beria. And if you pick a pot spot here and you look at the stream flow as a function of time, you can obviously see it was relatively small river, it's uh, down near zero, and then the rainfall hits, and the stream flow estimates that we're calculating go way up before coming back down. So this is the kind of time history you can get out of this, too. Now, one, one thing we're doing, I'm not going to go into detail uh, with the algorithm or anything, but with the one kilometer data that we do, so we have one kilometer stream flow Juan Wu came up with a way of calculating inundation based on that one kilometer stream flow. Again, looking for over bank overflow and doing some other things, moving some water around with water balance, and he comes up. It's not a perfect algorithm, but it gives us things like this. 
that uh, provide an estimate of inundation and actually water depth at a one kilometer resolution. So essentially we're taking all the information from the satellite rainfall and ending up with an inundation calculation. One of the reasons we're doing this, the user community are interested in things like this. If you're in the middle of this event is, where is the flood? How intense is the flood? You know, is the town in the flood? Is it, are, you know, what's the population density as a function of where the flood is? Things like that. So we can get this kind of estimate and, and we, it's a calculation so we can get it quickly, relatively quickly, okay? And you can see actually, I, met, I just pointed here, the blue and above is one meter depth. So essentially we're calculating a meter depth of water over a whole square kilometer in this. Now one of the, one of the things we we found out about that inundation calculation as we were using it, for various reasons I won't go into, it tends to take the water or dissipate the water relatively quickly. So we do a pretty good job when, when the rainfall is hitting, we're making the calculation, we get the inundation map. But if you look a few days later, a lot of the water, and it hasn't rained anymore, the water tends to dissipate too rapidly. So one of the things we've done, especially in trying to match up uh, with other remote sensing uh, information, is do a time integration of, of that water depth. And actually at every grid point, every one kilometer, pick out the maximum value over a period and then draw a map of that. And this is an example of that in which we've taken at every you know, kilometer grid point, the maximum flood depth that we've calculated over the 14th through the 19th. And again, we're coming up with something that looks similar to what we saw before, but you see more small, uh, a smaller scale of things coming out in the process. And here the, the, uh, it's the orange and above that's the, uh, the one meter depth. So you can see here where Beria is, you can see a lot of the uh, really very deep and pretty wide flooding is going on along here, but there is flooding uh, other places. Also, now we're gonna. So that that uh, that inundation map I showed you. That's a calculation. Okay, it's not an observation, and uh, and I'll come back to kind of the latency in this in a, in a minute. But one of the things is, well, how how good is that? What can we compare to, et cetera? Well, one of the things uh, that you know, a lot of remote sensing people are doing in terms of floods are using synthetic aperture radar observations to estimate flood inundation. And essentially, I'm certainly not an expert, but they use the signal differences between open water and land to, to try to tell where you have the flooding. And obviously they have a map of what is usual water, like lakes, even rivers, things like that. And they also do some tricks with using a pre-flood SAR image and then the during the flood SAR image. So I think they, they like to use that too. And there are different groups uh, doing this kind of algorithm development, I think, and, and really making a progress. This is over a large area. This is actually from a group in Luxembourg. I didn't know there was any real work being done in Luxembourg, but there is. Uh, a guy named Patrick Matkin and his group, uh, supported by the European Space Agency, that uh, does some very nice work work in that area. Now, what what happens here is uh, on the left here is is one of our inundation maps. And I've tried to match these up in space so you can see. Uh, you can see you've seen this one before. It's got the water depth and the inundation. Actually on the right here is another SAR analysis, not actually the one I showed you before. This is uh, by another group called UNISAT uh, in Europe. It's actually kind of interesting. What's happening is 
there are multiple groups using the same data, the SAR data, and each doing their own inundation mapping. And that's an interesting thing in the community. So when these events are going on, you have these maps flying around, and it's hard to tell where they're coming from and why there might be differences be, uh, between them. But you can see here, just in matched up, this looks pretty good compared to ours. In the middle here is actually another interesting product uh, from a company called AER, and they call it FloodScan. And it's based on passive microwave data and a digital elevation model. And uh, I won't go into detail here, but essentially they're using 37 gigahertz and other channels to get really wet land. And then they, and, well, and you'll see an example of this later, and then they use the DEM essentially to put the water near the bottom. Okay. But as you can see, just matching these up, they look fairly similar. Now there is a difference. One is our calculation, like here, was available on the 15th of March. You know, nearly immediate. They took about two or three days. Their product is actually daily, but with 37 gigahertz, if it's still raining, they can't make the calculation. If it's not raining, it's just cloudy, they can make the estimate, okay? So it took them another two or three days before they got this. I've also spent some time looking at their product for other cases. They don't always do that well, okay? But interestingly enough, this product is actually being used commercially by a group that insures farmers in Africa. Essentially, they get paid off that there's a flood when this product says there's a flood. It's kind of an interesting application of this. The other thing I haven't mentioned, I should maybe go back here a second here. Optical based uh, inundation estimates, you know, from MODIS or other kinds of visible uh, satellites are also very good, and I'll show you an example in a minute. Uh, but they obviously require cloud free areas. So it often takes a while until you get that estimate. In this case, it took quite a while. In fact, this is, this is actually a product, this is an automated product put out by NASA Goddard, a couple of friends of mine, Fritz Policelli and Dan Slayback, and they, they try to use MODIS, and that's about twice a day, to do uh, flooding estimates, inundation estimates. And this is an example, but this was occurring here, this is a three-day composite but ends at 25 March. If you remember, 15 March was the one. So you're waiting 10 days to get your estimate of the flood, although there was still some flooding. And if you look carefully, the white areas in here are clouds. So even then, you're still having areas that are blocked out by having a cloud. So there are difficulties uh, doing this kind of thing. Here's an example, just blowing that up, that image up, and comparing with ours again. And you can see they have the general pattern, but it's different, and they don't see any flooding anywhere else. Let's, we're going to go back to the SAR data. This is sort of a key diagram for us, because we're trying to now do a careful analysis of the inundation uh, estimate that we're calculating uh, versus the SAR inundation estimate, the observations. There's a lot of different colors here, but essentially the dark red is the good result. That's the re those are all the pixels where the, the GFMS, our calculation, is showing flood and SAR is showing flood. So we're doing pretty good. And there are other areas where the, the dark red is there. Okay. The pink area is where we're saying there's no flood. And the SAR is saying there's flood. So 
if you think if the if the SAR is right, that means we're underestimating the inundation in that area. Okay, the green is where we're saying there's flood, and the SAR is saying no flood. That's mainly the smaller rivers and tributaries. It might be a little bit too small a scale for them, although they can do pretty fine scale uh, work. But that's, that's what the result is. Okay. I've, I've drawn a, a dashed line here because you can see that if you look in this area up here, it looks like we're doing pretty good. Down here, it looks like uh, we're not doing so good. Now, one reason for that, if you remember, it's a calculation. It's based on the rainfall. So if we were underestimating the rain in that area, for example, we would underestimate the inundation. You can say you can see we have some like the red the red blocks here, but well, we're not getting enough. It looks like okay. So here's this horizontal line that kind of dividing. Now, if you go back to that seven day rainfall map that I showed you before when it came in, I've drawn that same horizontal line, that dashed line across here, and you can see that south of that. The satellite estimate is lower than north of it, obviously. It's still a fair amount of rain. It's 100 millimeters of rain. That's four inches of rain. But it's a lot less down here. <clears throat> so it could be, that from our standpoint, is that the satellite estimate of the satellite based estimate of rainfall is not giving us enough rainfall. And we're underestimating the inundation. It's at least a question mark, at least compared to the SAR data. I'm going to go back to this AER passive microwave based flood thing. And here's on the 19th of March when they were actually giving a good result. If you look at the blocky area, that's kind of the original 37 gigahertz uh, estimate. And they, they calculate a fractional flooding parameter. Okay. And you're seeing that there's a little bit of difference here. The really fine scale stuff, and I've plotted these on top of each other here, the way they do it, is the estimate that they make very fine scale by taking that coarse scale resolution information and pushing it down with the DEM into the fine scale area. So this is their final uh, estimate here. It's kind of an interesting technique. And I think it works well, especially in large cases like this. But I think there are still some limitations, as there are uh, to all of this. But again, it's going from about 15 kilometers down to actually less than uh, a one, one kilometer. But we can, take, we can take their data and sort of do the same thing I've done with you know, our calculation uh, versus uh, their data. And again, the, the red here is where we're both getting the right, we're both getting flooding. Okay? So they agree pretty well in this area up here. Here, I've changed the color scheme a little bit. Where it's green is where we're saying no flood, and the flood scan is, is saying flood. So it's a little bit down here. But if you notice, they're not. They're not getting a lot of flooding down in this area where our calculations are sh not showing a lot of uh, flooding. And there's other things here, like the blue is where we're getting flood along the small tributaries again, and, and they're not getting so much. So what this seems to show is that essentially the flood scan estimates agree more with our calculations than they agree with the SAR data. So now we have this apparent uh, paradox where you know one observation tool is showing us one answer in that area, and another one is showing us a different answer. The SAR data should be better, but it's not clear entirely. And I'd like to stop here, and and, and I think I'm, I've tried to give you so far an idea of you know what we're doing and, and how well we're doing, hopefully, especially with this one case study. But I give you an idea of sort of what happens to the data. 
we have a website and we don't monitor it and register people and do that type of thing. But we're getting about uh, 50 or so people, uh, unique visits a day that come on to the, to the, the website. When there's a big event, we get a lot more. When there's hardly anything going on, like this week, I noticed we were down into the 30s or something like that last week. <coughs> but, uh, you know, we do get people coming in and looking at it. We have some sort of interesting interactions with users. I mean, we go back, email back and forth with the World Food Program when there's an event going on like uh, like the event I've been uh, talking about. There are a bunch of people, uh, food program, which are very interesting. They have their own uh, meteorologists and flood people looking at data all the time. The World Food Program is a UN organization. They have their own air force. I'm not kidding you. They have, I don't know how many planes because this is the group that delivers food when there's a, a catastrophe like, like this flood. And they want to know where they have to send the food, how much food, how many people are affected, things like that. And that's what they're trying to calculate. We have other people we interact with. Uh, even US agencies have talked to us. And I know from running into people that um, military and uh, even uh, intelligence agencies uh, like to look at this, they're usually <clears throat> when they're talk if I've talked to them, they seem to want to talk about Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, kind of places you uh, <clears throat> might expect. Give me a minute. But <clears throat> I think they're looking at other places too. One of the things that's happened more recently is that there are organizations that are taking our data and presenting it as part of a package they put together. There's a group called the Flood Observatory that we work with at the University of Colorado, the Pacific Disaster Center. There's a group called the Global Flood Partnership, which acts as a conduit often in, in saying, we need to respond to this event and the different people doing this kind of work, remote sensing, kind of get together and do that, and, and some other ones here. So, sort of getting towards the end here, I just thought I'd mention a few things I think are going to be sort of where this kind of thing is going a little bit. <clears throat> One is actually not the future, it's the present. So, b back when, uh, I showed you the, the northeast branch of the Anacostia and where Essex is. Well, you can look that up these days in the, the Weather Service National Water Model. And they're doing some very interesting work. A lot of this has come in the past three, four years, I'd say. Interestingly enough, we've been doing this kind of calculation globally for about 10 years, okay? But they have gone off, and I think they've done a really nice job. So you can go in, to like the Northeast Branch here, and a couple of days ago I just plotted this out. And you can look at the estimates, and that comes from the stream gauge. But then they're actually using forecast, uh, NWP forecast, and other things. So they drive the model on an observational basis with radar rain gauge data over the United States. And then they use forecast, a precip go out and make forecasts. But you can get down to pretty fine scale, uh, these kind of size river reaches here, and, and make forecasts. It, it's very neat to look at that kind of stuff. There's also some new space missions uh, coming up in the near future. There's the SWAT mission, Surface Water and Ocean Topography, which is going to try to measure an, uh, essentially river height using altimeters and uh, LIDARs, radar altim altimeters and, and LIDARs. We already do this for lakes and for some big rivers. But this is going to get down to finer scale. And you can imagine having that kind of information 
uh, is going to help you a lot, including to try to figure out how the dams are operating. So you can get a better estimate on, on the dam. The other thing that's happening is, of course, is uh, in terms of the synthetic aperture radar, there's a new mission to go up that's got two different frequencies uh, of SAR uh, called NISAR, which is, I think, an Indian uh, NASA uh, mission. This one is multiple agencies uh, also. But that, that's going to really help out, I think, in, in giving us those inundation maps. Not all the time, but having this kind of information and this kind of information and combining it with the kind of calculations that we have been doing will really give you a, a better answer altogether, all I think. Uh, another thing that's actually happening with, with our data, uh, this is an example uh, where essentially the Pacific Disaster Center, which is in Maui, a really nice place to visit, uh, they're, they're uploading on a daily scale products that are coming out of our, well, actually one product, uh, the flood detection uh, and, and depth uh, calculation that we're doing both the observation part based on the satellite rainfall and the forecast part going out about five days. And they're putting that, in. I have a very nice display they've built up. I really like it. Essentially, you can make look at a map like this and look at the observations, and then you can run the movie loop, and so you can for, go out to the forecast. They do this globally. You can zoom in. You can do lots of uh, different things with this data set. But again, this is a place where our information is getting out, is being made available to other groups. In fact, they don't have it yet. But the TDC has a phone app that they have for disaster managers across the world that's got you know, umpteen million people that have downloaded the app. So if you can get yourself into something like that, it allows for your information to get out to a you know, much wider audience. Couple things. Uh, I've got this map. This is a figure from a paper by Yan et al., which uh, Juan Wu is uh, the main or the second author, I think. But using our kind of system to go back in time and calculate flood as a function of time. In this case, they're just doing a climatology, the season by the year of flood frequency. So you get an idea of this. You can look at interannual variations, et cetera all calculated based on the satellite rainfall. And you get an idea of, of how things are changing as a function of time. We have a, a project going on in-house. Uh, some of you probably know Ahmed Tavakoli here, who's actually uh, partly in the Army Corps of Engineers and also here at University of Maryland. And he and I and others here are, we have a small project uh, through the GPM science team. Uh, Ahmed's the, the PI. And what we're trying to do is use the runoff that's coming out of the satellite rainfall data that we already use in our system. And we're going to use that into the Army system, in which the, he's doing some very uh, fine uh, spatial resolution uh, routing, and it's, it's potentially useful uh, to be used uh, by the Army. So we're working on that. And sort of lastly, my colleague here, Karai Yilmaz, is visiting from uh, Ankara, a university in Ankara, Turkey, spending a year with us. And he's doing an evaluation of iMERGE uh, over Turkey. Uh, and other hydrology, using GFMS and other hydrology models. And I think one of the things that this is going to be interesting is Turkey has a lot of different terrain. And I think by doing this kind of careful analysis is going to be one, one hook in trying to determine what the potential or what the limitations are in the satellite uh, rainfall, at least over, over that area. So I'll just uh, finish up by saying I think uh, Floods around the globe, uh, even in data sparse regions, uh, can be monitored these days uh, with, I think, a pretty good degree of accuracy, uh, such that they, the information can be used uh, for uh, monitoring 
uh, for relief uh, processes, et cetera. The satellite rainfall estimates are, are valuable, although you know, we have to do, need additional analysis and validation. And I think this is true especially for heavy rain events. They're not easy, even if you're getting the overall bias about right. What you have to do is in these heavy rainfall events, if it's going to be useful for floods, you really have to do a, a, a good job. Uh, our calculated inundation estimates are available quickly and are useful, I think. Uh, and they compare often well with things like the, the SAR data. But one of the things we're actually trying to work on a little bit is to use all these estimates of, say, inundation together, the SAR data, other observations, our calculations, provide people with an integrated estimate of what the inundation, what's happening, so that it will be useful. You can imagine if you're one of the users, say, at the World Food Program, and you have an event like Tropical Cyclone Adai and the flood in Mozambique, things are happening very quickly, and you're inundated. And whereas on a day-to-day -day basis, they probably don't have a lot of information, sometimes when you have an event like this, you have too much information. They're getting an inundation calculation from over here, and they're getting one from over there, and they're trying to figure out, well, there are different times, there are different spatial resolutions. Which ones do we use? How do we, and they, they don't have time to really integrate them beyond just looking at a few of them and trying to uh, make a judgment. So if we could give them something that integrates this information, it, it, it might end up uh, being a step up. And that's what I talked down here in this last bullet here. But with that, I'll stop and hopefully take some questions. Thank you. Very nice talk, Bob. <laughs> so uh, uh, my question is, when you go from an inundation map that you show, in fact, you show, you seem to indicate that you overestimate because you are seeing inundation everywhere, right? So my question is, how do you go from an inundation map to a flood map? To me, those are two different things, right? I mean, it seems that you don't make the difference. You basically say, well, I, task if you I, I think, I think so, in so this my case, question, yeah, you said there's some, some threshold or some area, um, in order to call it a flood, it has to be not just right over the river, which you're showing that everything. Right. But it should be spreading out in some area or some kind of. Yeah. Well, um, essentially, yeah, if, if you look question. closely, yeah. I mean, even at one kilometer, I mean, one of the problems with a one kilometer, a lot of rivers aren't one kilometer wide, okay? But some are. So if they're wide enough, you'll actually see a, a blank strip in the middle, and you'll see things o over the bank. So in this case, inundation is uh, an estimate of where it's flooding. To a first approximation, even even the SAR or data, some threshold calculation, right? Yeah, the essentially, uh, yeah. anything exceed positive, then you call. I mean, it the inundation. algorithm. I mean, we're, we're, what you're doing here at the one kilometer, you're calculating a water depth everywhere, but essentially, you're trying to say where that that depth is above a threshold, yeah, and yeah. so, okay. and then you're, and but there is even after that, the algorithm sp spreads out the water a little bit. Uh, due to you know using water balance, et cetera. I mean, it's it's a whole technique in itself. Uh, but essentially, when we and our water depth thing, our threshold that we're using, like for our calculations right now, is very close to zero. It's it's not quite zero, but it's it's very close just to get out some noise near the bottom. But it's again, it's it's the water above the flood already. Okay. Yeah at each grid point. So it, it's, it's, it's pretty good. I mean, that's the kind of thing, though, that, uh, you know, ha it's, it's very difficult. Like, even in this case, you know, you have the SAR data, which is pretty good. But what you almost need, you need somebody on the ground telling you, go back and says, here's where the flood was. And that kind of thing is done sometimes in the US, for example. Or they, they actually go out and survey, and then they say, okay, here's where the flood is. What do the calculations look like, et cetera? 
it's not an easy thing, but I think we're getting to first base on it. Juan, maybe you want to make a comment. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just uh, want to add a little bit uh, uh, to response to Bill's question. Uh, why we see a lot of the uh, green colors for those small tributaries? Actually, most of these uh, colored, uh, green colored small tributaries we consider in in in, rea uh, in fact there are a lot of the amphro rivers. In most of the times of the year, those gray box are not uh, being covered by water at all. And in our algorithm, actually, a little details for that is we only recognize those rivers are flooding if that uh, water that that pixel was not covered by water at all in. 75% uh, of the time of that year. And then we can see, that's why we see a lot of the, uh, seems like that uh, we're flooding everywhere, but actually pretty, uh, we cannot uh, really validate that, but, but in these small upstream areas, we see these small rivers are uh, over bank flows, uh, in particular in this uh, big storms. And for the downstream areas, uh, all of this color are uh, indicated uh, by the depth of the water, one, like a one meter or three meters inundation. That, that Bob has already answered it quite, quite well. Thank you. Uh, uh, similar question. So basically, I think uh, in this southern Mozambique, as as the the situation may be contributed by two factors. One is, uh, if or not, the satellite and the estimated precipitation, so, which I, I believe, since we have some gauges, maybe uh, someone can do a quantitative comparison. Uh, there should be at least some gauges along the coast. Another thing is, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, Mozambique, the topography in the south and the north are very different. Uh, south uh, should be something like a plain, so that may, uh, I'm not sure how their rivers, you know, uh, are managed. Uh, if uh, they do not have a very high, you know, uh, the stuff over, over the, the two banks, then it's easily, uh, easily flooded out, even with, uh, you know, uh, rain for that is not very heavy. So th that might also be some factors. And those kind of things, uh, if I understand uh, correctly, the current, uh, uh, model does not reflect those kind of factors but the the uh, uh, to what extent the artificial you know dams or those kind of uh, artificial buildings will influence the flooding scenes because if uh, they do not have a very good you know uh, <coughs> do not build very high uh, uh, side banks maybe the the, the river what easily flooded out so. yeah i think that's a, that's a good point one thing i haven't done that southern area that uh, I, I was going to go try to look to see, you know, if the terrain was a lot different there. And, you know, for example, the SAR data was saying it was flooded. So was it was it, it did it tend to be very marshy area, or for example, or something yeah. like that? But I haven't I haven't gone in and looked. Yeah, I think it's also because uh, if you look in just the, in the past twenty years, there are several times big flooding over Mozambique. Oh, yeah. It happens very often. I think it's worse. In different areas. Any other questions? If not, Ms. Cole, and then thanks for speaking again. Thank you. Thank you, John.